Good morning and welcome to today's presentation, uh, Contemporary UK Politics and Economy, What are the Lessons for Canada? Uh, my name is Ron Stiles. I'm an executive in residence with Johnson Suriyama Graduate School, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event as your moderator. Uh, the Johnson Suriyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, uh, is a national hub for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We're a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on a spirit of cooperation and collaboration that really defines our province, Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we've swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested and devoted to advancing uh, the public value. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, Johnson Shama's physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories. The original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Salto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We're glad to welcome those of you joining us from across Turtle Island to make the acknowledgement that it's an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. I acknowledge, I encourage you to acknowledge and take a moment to reflect on the land you reside on and think about and express gratitude for the place and the people who are safe, who have safeguarded it through time. Now to help our event run smoother, we ask that attendees uh, stay muted. Uh, you can either have your video on or your video off. We're okay with uh, with either of those two approaches. Um, I would I would ask you, however, to turn your videos back on when we get into the question and answer period. It's a lot easier, okay, for uh, for the speaker or myself, okay, to uh, uh, associate names with particular faces, okay. So again, at the end, if you could turn on your uh, video, that would be appreciated. The format uh, format for today's event is as follows. Following my introductory remarks, our speaker will provide some opening thoughts on today's topic, and then I will pose a series of prepared questions. This will give you, our audience, uh, time to come up with some questions for today's speaker. As following this, we'll open it up to audience Q&A. Uh, our strong preference, uh, both your speaker and myself, is that we use uh, audience Qs and As, okay? That way we can address issues that are of direct concern to each of you. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to send your question to myself, Ron Stiles, and uh, we'll um, and I'll read the question off uh, to uh, to uh, to Ralph. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during today's event. If you have any logistical questions uh, online, you already see uh, a small note from Karen uh, Jaster LaForge. Uh, you can either contact her through chat or uh, her uh, email address is there as well, and you can send a, an email directly to uh, to Karen. Uh, please note that with, as with all of our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing uh, on the Johnson Sham website at a later date. Now, today's lecture is going to focus on uh, what I describe as a pivotal period uh, for the United Kingdom. Uh, there have been four very significant events that uh, either have occurred or are in the process of occurring that are having to be dealt with. Uh, the first and the, the one public people are most familiar with is Brexit. Uh, the UK separating from the European common market has been a shock, obviously, for the country and for uh, the economy, uh, one that they're transitioning their way through right now. Uh, they're experiencing very significant inflation, uh, and the economy and growth, uh, again, are, are just starting to, uh, to be renewed. Uh, the second is the war in Europe and the war specifically between the Ukraine and uh, Russia. And while Russia may call it a police action, okay, I describe it as a war and it's the first one in Europe essentially in 75 years. Uh, there's obviously been some uh, internal civil disturbances uh, in the Balkans from time to time but this is a, an all-out war and, and some people call it reminiscent almost of World War One in terms of the trench warfare. Uh, the third issue is recovery from the pandemic and um, you know all countries uh, experienced an impact to both their politics and to their economy uh, as a result of what happened with COVID-19. And uh, UK is no different, and it is interesting to see how that has had impacts, especially on the number of, uh, of uh, prime ministers that they've gone through over the past number of years. The last one is a new king is now sits on the throne uh, on the throne in uh, Great Britain. Uh, this will be the uh, first uh, coronation, first uh, turnover of royalty in uh, in uh, the UK in seventy years. And it marks uh, perhaps, if not a rethinking of exactly what the monarchy is in the entire Commonwealth, okay, it is raising new questions and new issues. 
Uh, the issue of slavery and reparations now is on the uh, on the docket, okay, for a lot of the countries, for instance, in the Caribbean. Uh, now, I'd like to first introduce our speaker today. It's the Honorable Ralph Goodell. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce you, Ralph. Uh, raised on a family farm near Wilcox, Saskatchewan, uh, Ralph received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Regina in 1971 and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Saskatchewan in 1972. He's got practical experience in business, agriculture, law, broadcasting, as well as both federal and provincial politics. He was first elected to the Parliament of Canada in 1974 at the age of 24, representing Assiniboia in Saskatchewan. In the 1980s, he served as a leader of the Provincial Liberal Party and was elected in the Saskatchewan Legislative Assembly in 1986. And I remember seeing him across the legislature and I had to appear in various uh, committees and forums over time. Uh, Mr. Goodell returned to the House of Commons in 1993 as the Member of Parliament for Wascana and was subsequently re-elected in 1997, 2000, 2004, 2006, 2008, 2011, and 2015. He served as uh, a federal cabinet member, both as Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Minister of uh, Natural Resources, Leader of the Government in the House of Commons, Minister of Public Works, uh, Government Services, uh, Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. In March 2020, Mr. Goodell was appointed Special Advisor to the Prime Minister for Canada's ongoing response to Iran's uh, shooting down of Ukraine International Airline Flight PS752, and he has now taken up residence and an occupation over in uh, UK as our ambassador. So uh, I'm pleased to floor, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to uh, Ralph Goodell, and so he can share some uh, insight and thoughts on today's topic. Well, hello everyone, and uh, I'm very glad to be with you today, Ron. Thank you for your kind introduction and for the opportunity to uh, share some reflections as Canada's uh, High Commissioner in the United Kingdom. For some 25 months now, it has been my great honour to be the ambassador and official spokesperson for Canada in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It is a terrific assignment, partly because London and the UK are simply wonderful places to be with history and culture and something fascinating or completely outrageous on virtually every street corner. On top of that, London is a major global intersection for international politics, economics, diplomacy, and intrigue at a whole variety of different levels. The whole world passes through London pretty much every month or so. This assignment is terrific, too, because the relationship between Canada and the UK is long and deep, it's proactive, and it's productive. And we are living through an era of extraordinary events. A platinum jubilee, a state funeral, a coronation, those things don't happen very often. Uh, lots of turbulence in British domestic politics, Brexit, of course, trade negotiations, COVID, a war in Europe, the reemergence of big power rivalries around the world, and looming very soon, a British general election. So to say the least, it is a lively time. To uh, set some context, our High Commission in the United Kingdom is Canada's oldest diplomatic mission abroad. We've had representation here in London since 1869. With about 300 employees, this is one of Canada's largest foreign posts and we're perched conspicuously on Trafalgar Square since 1925. Canada House, as everybody calls the place, is the most visible embassy in all of Britain. Physically, Canada is 45 times bigger than the United Kingdom, with about half the population. You could fit all of the UK within the four corners of Saskatchewan. In that space, Saskatchewan has 1 million people, and the UK has nearly 70 million people. So density is one big distinction between our two countries. We are both wealthy G7 nations with GDP at $3.1 trillion US. Britain is the sixth largest economy in the world. It used to be number five, but has just been overtaken by India. Canada is number nine in the world with GDP at 2.1 trillion dollars US. On an individual basis, 
Canada's GDP per, per capita is a bit better than the Brits by about 6%. We're just above $58,000 US and they're just below $55,000 US per person. The cost of living, as Ron mentioned, is a concern in both countries. Inflation in Canada at last report was running at 4.4%. That is down sharply from the peak of more than 8% about a year ago. In the UK, due largely to very stubborn energy and food costs, inflation had been stuck at more than 10% for a very long time. But in figures released just today, British CPI has dropped now to 8.7%. Energy costs have moderated, and that explains a bit of why the, uh, the inflation rate has gone down. But food cost inflation is still running in the UK at very close to 20%. The central bank rate in both countries is 4.5. The credit rating for the government of Canada is pretty consistently at AAA. For the UK government, it is closer to AA. The overall economic relationship between Canada and the United Kingdom is worth more than $410 billion. Two-way trade in goods and services totals about $42 billion annually, making the UK our third largest trading partner after the US and China. At the moment, we're running a surplus on trade in goods, and a small deficit on services. The investment side of things is even more impressive. Britain is Canada's second largest source of foreign direct investment and our second largest destination. Including both FDI and regular portfolio investments, British ownership in Canada now totals more than $160 billion and Canadian investments in the UK exceed $209 billion. A key player in much of this investment is Canada's major in pension funds, with UK investments valued now at about $120 billion. While not the only form of Canadian ownership in, in the UK, our Canadian pension fund model of large-scale, long-term high quality investments is a very significant factor in Canada's economic impact, impact in Britain. In return, British investment markets are a source of stability and reliability for the retirement incomes of millions of Canadians. Most Britons are probably quite unaware that Canada is a big owner of British assets, driving economic activity and creating jobs in railways, ports, airports, public utilities, the production, transmission, and distribution of, of energy, both conventional and renewables, innovation and technology platforms, student housing, childcare, commercial real estate, and more, ranging all the way from nuclear fusion to the national lottery. Canadians own a big piece of the action. Even more important, Canada and the United Kingdom share hundreds of years of history and heritage, including the same monarch, similar governmental, legal, and commercial systems, strong military traditions, robust cultural and academic ties, too many family linkages to even begin to count, and above all, a deep reservoir of trust and respect based on values that we have promoted and defended together in the world, and for which we both have always been prepared to sacrifice, to safeguard our way of life. That tight relationship between Canada and the UK is probably more important now than it ever has been for two interrelated reasons. First, autocratic and often violent regimes are in the ascendancy around the world. Democracy is more of a minority and at greater risk today than ever before in our lifetime. In large portions of the so-called global south, a combination of audacious diplomacy, disinformation, 
economic coercion, big dollars and debt, all poured in by China and Russia, has inflated the influence of those two countries while diminishing ours. And secondly, since World War II, the United States has been the leading bulwark for democracy in the world, but populism, extremism, polarization, and foreign interference may be rendering America potentially less willing or less available to be the familiar, reliable participant in global affairs that we've come to know and depend upon for the past 80 years. Others are asserting claims of power and leadership, and they have a much different set of values and ambitions. All of that makes Canada's connections with the United Kingdom that much more vital as family, allies, partners, and friends. The importance of our work together has been especially evident since February of 2022, when Putin illegally reinvaded Ukraine and relaunched his brutal war of imperial aggression with a brazen sense of impunity and unmistakable repeated violations of the United Nations Charter. Putin's war is crudely punctuated by war crimes, crimes against humanity, sexual violence, torture, kidnapping, the terrorizing of children, the wanton destruction of homes and schools and hospitals and civilian infrastructure and innocent bodies dumped in mass graves. Putin's, Putin holds the poor and the elderly to ransom across Europe with high energy costs. And hungry people in the most fragile countries are threatened by Putin with even greater starvation. Most countries in the world, more than 140 members of the United Nations, have voted consistently over this past year to condemn Putin's vile behavior. Only a tiny handful of the most corrupt, disreputable regimes actually support Russia. But more than 40 countries abstain or fail to show up when a vote is called, including about a dozen from the Commonwealth. Putin's insidious influence is deeply disturbing. Isolated and delusional, Putin thought he would be welcomed as a liberator in Ukraine. He thought he would conquer all the resistance within days. He thought the free world would be easily divided and wilt away. He was wrong on every count. 15 months later, freedom-loving people everywhere have never been more united to help defend the sovereignty of Ukraine and their sovereign right not to be attacked and to live in peace. United also to defend the integrity of international institutions, the sanctity of human rights, the viability of the rule of law, and a rules-based system of decent behavior. That Putin was surprised at the depth of character in the Ukrainian people is a measure of his ignorance of who they are. Canadians know who they are. Ukrainians have been emigrating to Canada for more than 130 years. They are nation builders. Today, more than 1.4 million Canadians, close to 4% of our total national population, trace their family heritage to Ukraine. We have the second largest Ukrainian diaspora in the world. We stand in awe, but we are not surprised at the strength and skill, the determination and resilience, the tenacity, the courage and the valor of the Ukrainian people. Their thirst for freedom is legendary. Their dedication to democracy, independence and self-determination is unquenchable. Their culture, mentality and identity are distinctive, priceless and very real. So yes, Ukrainians will fight for all of these things for as long as it takes. And as they do so, they are the global front line 
for democracy everywhere. And the free world must stand with them, as the G7 reaffirmed so unequivocally in Hiroshima this past weekend. The United Kingdom and Canada have been standing with Ukraine from the very beginning. For several years before Putin's war, we were actively training Ukrainian defense forces at bases in Ukraine. Now that vital training is continuing at bases in the United Kingdom, as well as in Poland and Latvia. This is practical, high value support that makes a big difference on the ground. Ukrainian forces have been impressively proficient and professional training by Canadians, the British and others, is part of the reason why. Like the UK, Canada is also providing military equipment and supplies, transport logistics, intelligence, economic support, loan guarantees, humanitarian aid, and technical assistance. Since the beginning of last year, all of that adds up now to more than $8 billion in Canadian support so far. We've also received more than a million refugee applications, and we've processed over 700,000 so far. And coordinating closely with the UK, we have applied extensive sanctions and other more creative penalties to render Putin as much of an outcast as possible. Together, we've strongly supported Finland and Sweden joining NATO. We've helped to strengthen NATO's eastern flank with Canada leading an enhanced battle group in Latvia, while the UK leads in Estonia. And Canada is upgrading its diplomatic footprint across the Baltics and Eastern Europe. With Putin bludgeoning Ukraine and menacing elsewhere, with tensions rising in the Indo-Pacific around China's ambitions, and with risks and threats in other places in a dangerous world, Canada and the UK are carefully examining how to broaden and deepen our already extensive security, intelligence, and defense collaboration. As one example, Canada is creating a special unit in our Global Affairs Department to help better recognize and combat Russian disinformation. And we are embedding Canadian talent in the counterpart British unit here in London. Other areas of mutual interest include foreign interference, economic security, reliable supply chains, critical minerals, cybersecurity and other fields of advanced technology, more robust connections with the global south, and the marshalling of resources for Ukraine's ultimate reconstruction and recovery. Before I wrap this up and go to questions, let me raise briefly two other topics that have been very prominent on our agenda these past two years. One is trade, and the other is the arrival of a new monarch. Starting way back in 1973, as a member of the European Economic Commun Community and then the European Union, Britain has relied on the EU to manage its trade relations. So Canada-UK trade was covered very effectively by the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, known as CETA for short, between Canada and the EU. But with Brexit in 2020, all of that changed. A temporary continuity agreement was put together, modeled after CETA, to fill the gap caused by Britain's exit from the EU until a new bilateral FTA could be properly negotiated. One of my first official visitors at Canada House in the spring of 2021 was Liz Truss in her capacity then as the UK Minister of International Trade. She was launching her public consultations on the proposed negotiation of a standalone bilateral Canada-UK free trade agreement. Both countries finished their legal and parliamentary preliminaries over the following few months, and formal negotiations on the FTA began in March of 2022. Five rounds have now been concluded. Number six will take place 
in June in Ottawa. Round seven is set for London in September. Both sides report very good progress and ongoing optimism. Talks are scheduled to conclude by next spring. We're both aiming for an ambitious outcome that will promote successful trade diversification. For the UK, that means diversification beyond the EU, and for Canada, of course, beyond the US. We also want to work effectively together to protect ourselves against the trade distorting consequences of foreign measures like the massive US Inflation Reduction Act, which has almost nothing to do with either inflation or reduction, but it's a, it's a powerful economic measure in the United States that is distorting patterns around the world. And we need to cope with that together. We want to advance gender equality, diversity, and indigenous reconciliation. We want to promote high labor standards and environmental integrity because both our economies are built around small and medium-sized businesses. We want this FTA, the new trade agreement, to help more and more of those small and medium-sized businesses to export and trade because when they do, they become more competitive, more innovative, more profitable, and they pay higher wages. We want to advance, advance the digital economy, which has become such a pervasive part of our lives since the pandemic. We want to promote science, research, and technology, and creative brain power partnerships, which allow us to pool our skills and our talents and take on the world together in such fields as advanced manufacturing, protein, food, and life sciences, the aerospace and automotive sectors, AI, quantum, clean energy, and climate change. There will always, of course, be trade challenges to overcome. And typically, agriculture and the interests of farmers are among the most difficult issues to resolve on both sides. We certainly saw that in the multilateral discussions about the UK application to join the CPTPP, that is the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. That deal, struck successfully a few years ago, brought 11 countries with Pacific interests together as trading partners with high standards, including Canada. The pact is open for others to join, providing they meet the required thresholds and make the same commitments as the original 11. The United Kingdom was the first country to apply to get in to the CPTPP. Trade representatives from all of the 11 member countries poured over the details of what the UK brought to the table. From the very beginning, through Trade Minister Mary Ng, Canada was the first to be supportive of the UK application to join, but it was not a superficial exercise. The scrutiny was intense. In the end, the CPTPP will be stronger with the addition of another G7 economy. Once the UK is fully included, the CPTPP will cover 16% of global GDP and 600 million consumers. Now that's not to say everyone is happy. Canadian cattle producers are concerned about the UK's intention to continue its ban against beef imports treated with certain hormones, which is a very common practice across North America. Cattle producers are also unhappy about the false criticism that some British commentators make suggesting the Canadian food safety and health of animal systems are somehow inferior. Let's be crystal clear. Canada has an excellent food system. It compares favorably with the very best on earth. And it's certainly every bit as good as the British one. Our satisfied customers include some of the most sophisticated and demanding buyers in the world. Indeed, the only major health of animals issue in recent memory in Canada, dates back some 30 years 
to when a case of BSE was imported from the United Kingdom. That fiasco cost Canadian producers billions. Trade bans are just recently beginning to come off. So Canadians are totally attuned to quality and safety issues and top of the line animal husbandry. The basic point is this, the rules of the CPTPP require any border measures that restrict imports to be rooted in sound scientific analysis. The original 11 members agreed on that and it applies to all new members too. The UK asserts vigorously that it is willing and able to meet all CPTPP thresholds. That's good. They must be held to that commitment to sound science, just as all the rest of us are too. And let me suggest to advance transatlantic knowledge, understanding, and trust on these issues, it would be helpful to have an in-depth ongoing dialogue among our respective agricultural producers, processors, system inspectors and regulators, and our scientific communities to ensure we know each other well, that we communicate effectively, and that we operate constructively from the same solid factual foundation. Finally, let me just say a word about His Majesty King Charles III, the new King of Canada. Royal events are a very intriguing part of the work of a Canadian High Commissioner, and this past year especially so. About a year ago now, we were celebrating the happy and glorious Platinum Jubilee of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Then in September, we said a very sad goodbye to our longest serving monarch with an absolutely spectacular state funeral. Her eldest son, of course, the Prince of Wales, acceded to the throne immediately, but the formal coronation of King Charles took place just at the beginning of, of the month of May. No one does ceremony quite like the British, and they were at their royal best this past year. In terms of logistics and security, London has not seen anything quite like this since World War II. And given large numbers in attendance from Canada, officially and otherwise, and given the location of Canada House on Trafalgar Square in the heart of London, our High Commission team was very heavily engaged. Of course, you hear questions raised now about the future of the monarchy, and that's only natural. Queen Elizabeth was the only monarch most of us have ever known. When that much admired persona leaves the stage, and a successor takes over, people will have questions about where to from here. I hope we take this opportunity to study carefully the effective nature of our democratic constitutional monarchy as a successful form of government compared to all the others. There is significant value in our system which distinguishes head of state from head of government. Head of government is where all the political wrangling happens as it should. Head of state is set apart from that to embody the values and principles that unite us to provide cohesion, stability, and continuity above the fray. When head of state and head of government are combined in one, too often political problems morph quickly into constitutional problems, which become hugely debilitating, as we have seen very recently in some other countries. By comparison, our system has functioned pretty well. In addition, there are three practical matters to consider. First, there is no consensus on change to what. You cannot argue for something different without defining precisely what the difference is. Second, you can never open the Constitution to adjust just one little thing. You will be launching an open-ended constitutional rethink that you can expect to be long and distracting and maybe based on past experience, 
pretty painful too. And third, this type of amendment would take unanimous consent among the Senate, the House of Commons, and all of the provinces. And that is pretty unlikely. Most importantly though, King Charles is already at work on things that matter to many Canadians, promoting strong communities in which people volunteer to serve others, securing a clean environment which supports, not contradicts, but supports a prosperous economy, providing young people with the skills and opportunities to thrive, and advancing reconciliation and healing with Indigenous people. The Prince of Wales, as the King was, has already made 18 official visits to Canada into every corner of the country. And on issues like reconciliation, he is no newcomer. He was traveling into Indigenous communities and listening to Indigenous leaders and elders long before most others. 48 hours before his coronation, he sat down personally with the elected leadership of Indigenous organizations from Canada. His bona fides are very strong. And it just may be that King Charles, with his Indigenous vice-regal representative in Canada, Governor General Mary Simon, the two of them may just have the opportunity to change the course of history for the better for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike. And with that, Ron, thank you. Thanks for your very kind attention. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Goodell, for your thoughts. Um, I am gonna to go to questions uh, from our audience right away because there's a, a number that have already come in. And uh, the first one is from Catherine Gibson and uh, it reflects uh, a potentially a mistake I may have made at the very start in the introduction, but please explain the difference in the roles of an ambassador and a high commissioner. I've, I've tended to think that they're interchangeable, but I don't know if they are truly. Uh, as, as far as I know, Ron, they are identical. Uh, it is purely a change in uh, our difference in nomenclature uh, that exists within the Commonwealth, uh, where uh, you are the ambassador from one Commonwealth country to another Commonwealth country. You are called in that other country a high commissioner as opposed to an ambassador. But the functions, the functions are absolutely the same. And, and uh, uh, it, 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 when, when, when the first commissioner was appointed uh, from Canada to the UK back in 1869, uh, he, he was given the job of raising money for the railways. Uh, it seems like that's a perpetual preoccupation in Canadian politics. Uh, but but the, uh, the chief function was to raise money to build the railway. And the person given that function to raise money in the UK for that purpose was called a financial commissioner. Um, and when the, the, the role was expanded to include more diplomatic functions, uh, which happened in 1880, uh, and the first, the first uh, uh, person to bear the title of high commissioner was appointed in 1880, and that was a Alexander Galt, who had been... Uh, uh, Canada's first finance minister back in 1867. Uh, so he uh, he brought with him a lot of financial expertise, but uh, uh, the diplomatic function as well. So it, it is purely, as far as I know, a difference in language without a difference in function. That's excellent. I, a little bit of, uh, of Canadian history or maybe trivia to a certain extent. <laughs> it's very, very interesting from my perspective. Um, a second question comes from uh, Jer Jeremy Rayner. Uh, Brexit served to reopen a number of difficult national unity issues in the UK, including Scottish independence and Irish reuni reunification. Are there any lessons from the UK that may apply to Quebec or Alberta? Uh, I, I think the point is never, ever take these issues for granted uh, or, uh, or uh, become complacent about, uh, about issues that, that do affect uh, uh, unity. Uh, and cohesion within the country. Uh, the, uh, the, the United Kingdom, of course, is, is much tighter geographically. Uh, the, uh, I find that, that when you say I'm going from here to there in the UK, 
They don't talk about it in terms of miles or kilometers. It's, it takes 20 minutes or it takes a half an hour or it takes four hours to get to Edinburgh and, and those sort of things. It's measured in terms of time rather than, uh, than, uh, than distance. Um, but in the last number of years, of course, the UK has been going through its own form of, of um, federalism, uh, which they call here devolution. And there has been legislature, legislation in Westminster that has devolved certain powers that used to be held centrally by the, by the government in Westminster to Wales and Scotland and, uh, uh, and Northern Ireland. Um, if you remember correctly, after uh, the uh, 1995 referendum in Canada, we went through uh, a similar exercise where things like manpower training were, were devolved to the provinces as opposed to being managed uh, by, the, by the, uh, the central government in, uh, in Ottawa. So both here and, and back home in Canada, that, that notion of devolution, I think, is, is part of the way, or part of the, the thinking of how you, you, you deal with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the tensions that, uh, that build up within a, uh, within a federation. Um, currently, um, uh, I think uh, Mr. Sunak, Prime Minister Sunak, uh, is dealing uh, very effectively with uh, the situation uh, uh, in Northern Ireland and the issue about the border between Northern Ireland and, and Ireland. Of course, that wasn't an issue when both the UK and Ireland were in the, uh, uh, the EU because those borders were, uh, were absolutely frictionless. They didn't matter. Um, but now that the UK has withdrawn and taken Northern Ireland with it, uh, the issue of a border becomes a, a serious question. Uh, and uh, for a while, it was a point of, of, of real dispute and, and contention uh, when Mr. Bron Mr. Johnson was, uh, was prime minister and, and when um, uh, Liz Truss was prime minister. Uh, but prime minister Truss began a process and Mr. Sunak continued it uh, to try to negotiate a practical resolution of this Irish border question uh, with, the, uh, with the EU. Uh, those negotiations were protracted um, and uh, they were certainly difficult. Uh, but at the end of the day, earlier this spring, an agreement was, was announced. It was called the, uh, the Windsor Framework uh, that, uh, that described how this border situation would be, be managed. And it's, it's complex, but in a nutshell, when goods are being shipped from the mainland of the United Kingdom to Northern Ireland, if those goods are destined as a final destination in, in Northern Ireland, they go in the green lane and there are no border checks. But if they are destined to go through Northern Ireland into, uh, into the Republic of Ireland, then they go in the, in the red lane and are subject to the normal border checks or at least, at least an appropriate set of border checks for that, for that transshipment. A lot of these details are still being, being worked out, um, but the expectation is that this arrangement may resolve the issue. Uh, and if it does, then that's a very big political win uh, for Rishi Sunak uh, in being able to, to negotiate a border arrangement that, uh, that satisfies or at least largely satisfies uh, most of the concerns in, in Northern Ireland. The, uh, the, the holdouts so far uh, are the DUP, the, uh, uh, the uh, Unionist Nationalist Party in uh, uh, the Unionist Party, excuse me, in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, um, which has been boycotting the local legislative assembly, the, the, the assembly that would exercise the powers that have been devolved uh, is basically on strike because it can't sit without the DUP uh, participating uh, in, in the process. Um, they've got some regional elections over just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there will be the marching season that is always a very emotional time in Ireland uh, during the summer. It is possible that the, uh, the local government may get back into action uh, late in the summer or in the fall after these tense periods have had a time, uh, a time to, uh, to subside. Uh, 
but it was significant that on on the uh, the Easter uh, holiday season uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, there was a big celebration of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that brought an end to the troubles in uh, Northern Ireland 25 years ago uh, and brought an era of peace for the last 25 years. Uh, Bill Clinton was there as uh, the architect of that process. Senator John Mitchell from the United States, who who largely directed the process was there. And I'm happy to say General uh, John de Chastelaine from Canada was properly recognized as well uh, as a retired military officer from Canada and a former ambassador to the United States. He took on the job, the really tough job of decommissioning the weapons, going into all of the little enclaves and collecting the weapons and then physically destroying them because the, so they couldn't, could never be used again. Um, there would be no peace in Northern Ireland without that weapons decommissioning. And uh, it took the skill and the, the, the balance and the common sense of a Canadian like John de Chastelaine uh, to make it work. And he was celebrated uh, at this anniversary uh, events in, uh, in Northern Ireland at the, at the beginning of, uh, of uh, the Easter holiday. A potential resolution to the border is obviously something I think everyone has been waiting for or anticipating. Um, you know, I can't believe that anybody would want to see a return to the troubles, as you mentioned. So that's uh, that's great news from my perspective. Uh, this question comes from Peter Phillips. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a potential for greater collaboration between the UK and Canada in the post Brexit world. In early years, there was great excitement both in the UK and in Canada that we would soon see new bilateral partnerships partly economic, but also socially and economically, that effort seems to have gone quiet from our end. Is the UK still open to bilateral engagement or is it going to focus on multilateral efforts more? Uh, no, the, uh, the door is wide open. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're pushing on an open door uh, in this conversation about uh, uh, broader and, and, and deeper partnerships right across the piece. The, the focus in the last little while has tended to be on those related to uh, security, intelligence, and, and defense operations, I think, because of the preoccupation with, uh, uh, with the, the war in Ukraine uh, and the issues in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, the, the examination has focused on, on those sorts of things. Uh, and as I mentioned in my remarks, one of those uh, deals is already in place around the issue of, of disinformation and how you, you fight that. Uh, uh, both Canada and, and the UK are, are collaborating in, uh, in that effort, uh, but there are many other topics uh, that, that uh, could well be included. Uh, uh, work on uh, AI, for example, you can hardly open a, uh, a newspaper or a magazine or an academic paper these days without a discussion about the, uh, the, goods, the good and the bad, the pros and the cons of, uh, of AI technology. Um, that's an area where the British have expertise. They've got a big trade show coming up in a few weeks uh, about a, uh, artificial intelligence technology. Canada has been a, a, a world leader in some dimensions of, of AI. The University of Alberta, for example, uh, has, been, uh, has been very prominent uh, in that field. Uh, so that, that's another area where we can, where we can collaborate and, and pull together. Uh, the digital economy is something that we're trying to find the right way to incorporate in the in the free trade agreement, so you can you can protect all of the uh, uh, the intellectual property aspects of of uh, uh, the digital world, but at the same time use it to to expand trade and commerce and and uh, profitability and advantages on 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 both sides. Uh, so uh, broadly, the uh, uh, the uh, the world or the UK is wide open to these kinds of conversations, and especially I, I'm finding uh, run in the in the academic world, um, uh, the 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 big education clusters in the UK around around Cambridge and, and Oxford, people are very uh, well aware of. But uh, the University of Durham has a very healthy uh, research uh, uh, collaboration with five or six Canadian uh, universities. Uh, so does the University of London, LSE. Uh, there is a rich academic environment uh, in the UK uh, and they welcome uh, partnerships, uh, both on the, on the student exchange side of things, the, uh, the academic professional exchange, 
side as well, uh, but research uh, and, um, and, and undertaking projects together. Uh, we learned the value of that, uh, it, at least in part, uh, during the, uh, the COVID pandemic and the, and the search for the vaccines and the way the scientific community, the business community, and the government regulatory community came together, starting from absolute zero to the first administration of a successful vaccine in 300 days. And now because of the learning experiences from that, the, the, the scientific community says they could, if they had to do it over again, they think they could do it now in, a, in 100 days. Imagine how many lives would have been saved if this whole exercise was 200 days faster uh, than it was last time. And, and, and that came from collaboration, uh, academic collaboration, but also with business and with the regulators. Uh, and uh, my impression, uh, I may be biased, but my impression is that uh, the UK particularly appreciates uh, doing, doing business and doing partnerships uh, with Canadians. Um, and, and so I think we've got an open door. I mean, that, that sounds very inviting. Uh, it seems like it's a, an opportunity for us to reach out and potentially reach out uh, through our ambassador in, uh, in uh, yeah. uh, the UK. So thank yeah. you very much for that. Uh, the next question is from a, a mutual colleague, Dale Eisler. Um, is the National Health Service facing the same issues, challenges as Canada's health system? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the, uh, the NHS um, was under stress before COVID. Uh, COVID stressed it and strained it in, in, in many, many uh, ways that maybe had not been anticipated before. Uh, and I notice as, as you get closer and closer to the, to the uh, uh, next election, which everybody is expecting will be sometime in the fall of 2024, uh, that'll be that'll be an interesting political fall with both the UK and the US ha having elections and and uh, who knows how many other countries will will pile into that uh, into that time frame. Um, but the uh, uh, both political parties uh, include items in their draft manifestos about strengthening the NHS uh, specifically for. Uh, uh, for Prime Minister Sunak, he talks about uh, uh, reducing wait lists. And uh, where have we heard that in Canadian politics about reducing wait lists for the health care system? Uh, I think every, every, every premier, every opposition leader, federally and provincially, has run on that platform. Uh, and they do so here in the UK. Uh, and for, uh, for, uh, for Labour, for Keir Starmer, uh, they uh, talk about... Uh, uh, building an NHS is fit for the future. Uh, so the, the, the issues are, uh, are very similar uh, and the stresses have been made obvious by the impact of COVID. Uh, and, and now as, as the UK has come out of, of COVID, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, finding the ways to just to, to, to pick up the slack uh, is putting a huge strain on, on the, uh, the personnel in the healthcare system. And so you've had doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, dispatchers, um, uh, all, and, and emergency uh, medical technicians, uh, all on strike at different points of time over the course of the last six or eight months. And those strikes are ongoing in the, uh, in the British system, although some of them have been, have been resolved. Uh, so yes, Dale, the, uh, the stresses and strains sound very familiar. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the next one is uh, uh, an issue that I think most people wonder about always. There's what you hear you know, through our, our media about relationships between countries. And there's, there's what you hear maybe through some of the, the social media sites on top of sort of regular media, et cetera. But um, the question comes from Brenda Erickson. It's, I'm curious how Canada and Canadians are viewed by people in the UK. They see Canada. Uh, from your perspective, Rob? Well, I, I, through um, 35 or 40 years of, of Canadian politics, I, I always learned that you, you gathered enormously good information from uh, taxi drivers and bus drivers. 
uh, because they do a constant poll 24 hours a day and they're right up to date. Uh, so judging by uh, the, uh, the, the, the taxi drivers that I've talked to in London, uh, there's a very positive attitude about Canadians. Most of them have family in Canada uh, and they're looking forward to a visit sometime soon. So it's um, uh, by that informal measure, uh, the, uh, uh, the mood is, is very positive. Certainly, in the uh, in the reaction that I get from the British government on on working together economically, working together on the security and intelligence and defense issues, um, there's a there's a a real appetite for uh, for partnerships with Canadians, doing business with Canadians. We are we are familiar. Um, uh, I think there's a comfort level there. With, uh, with Canadians that, uh, that is very positive. The downside of that is that the relationship is almost too familiar uh, because you, you can get taken for granted. Uh, and sometimes you have to stamp your feet a bit uh, in order not to be uh, um, overlooked. Um, and, and that's why I, I make the point about uh, uh, some of the rough edges around the, uh, the, the trade agreement that... Uh, that has been uh, negotiated with the CPTPP, uh, and some of the same issues might apply to the to the FTA. Um, uh, th th there needs to be uh, fairness and understanding and reciprocity uh, moving both ways, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's important for Canada when when we've got truth and justice on our side to stand our ground and uh, and. Uh, don't just capitulate. Uh, I guess it, I, I don't want to overstate it, but they're no longer an empire and we're no longer a colony. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an evolving relationship. And one of the, the interesting things that I, I've, I've come to recognize over the past period of time is that uh, our traditional relationship with the UK, English people that uh, migrated to Canada, okay, and still have relatives in England. And I'm, I'm a good example of that I still have lots of relatives in England. But um, in addition, right now, the migrants that are coming both to Canada and to the UK, a lot of them say, uh, share similar backgrounds, come from similar countries. And so often you'll talk to somebody here in Canada, okay, that is immigrated from a, a British Commonwealth country, and they will have uh, other family members that are actually in the UK. And so in some way, our linkages are being renewed in a, in a much different way than maybe they started. But, you know, those all create linkages, which I think are, are, are very, very important. So um, yep. there's a, uh, a, another question here that I thought, um, you know, got to a, a common challenge, not just for Canada and, uh, and the UK, but rather is a common challenge for a lot of countries right now that uh, are under stress as a result of maybe social media and other things that are, are changing the dynamics of our society. And the question uh, comes from Catherine and uh, I'll read it verbatim. You mentioned trust several times in your remarks. Trust is essential, for a, is essential for a functional democracy as well as for free trade. Trust is under stress in both countries. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on how to manage this internal threat. It's um, it it it's something you have to work at uh, quite literally uh, every day. Um, our our system of governance, uh, when you when you compare it to uh, any other system around the world, and when I say ours, I'm saying both ours and the UK because they're so similar. Uh, our our form of government uh, and the way we we go about. Uh, uh, practicing our democracy um, really does rely on the public's trust in institutions uh, and in the uh, integrity of uh, people who participate in the in the process, um, and that is that is so fragile, um, and it's so susceptible to distortion, partly by social media, but by particularly by social media that may be originating in St. Petersburg or Beijing. Uh, and a lot of it does. Uh, and people, uh, uh, people shouldn't be um, naive about, about some of this stuff. And, and you know, I, I think we have, to, we have to work very hard on uh, a lot of uh, good, solid, uh, impartial, unbiased, uh, civics information and 
and uh, education to make sure that we fully understand how our own system of democracy works um, and what its, what its strengths are, what, it, what its weaknesses are, where the vulnerabilities are. Um, the, uh, the last uh, two elections, uh, there has been a system put in place federally to monitor the risk of foreign interference. And then if that foreign interference uh, uh, gets to a significant level that it might in fact impact the outcome of the election, there's a system for making it public, uh, not through the political process, but by, through the, uh, through the uh, non-political impartial public service. Uh, and the UK is looking at how they might set up the same kind of a, of, of a system to alert voters to the fact uh, that uh, they may be the subject or the object of uh, manipulation or distortion. Um, we're just at the beginning of this. Social media is still very young. Uh, the, the use of technology is, uh, is still uh, in its infancy, really. Um, and I think it, it, it behooves us that our people who are interested in the proper functioning, successful functioning of democracy, uh, in Canada, in the UK, in the United States, in other democracies around the world, uh, to work very closely with each other, to share information, share experiences, and make sure that we're benefiting from each other's knowledge and protecting ourselves uh, as much as we possibly can. I don't think we know the way out of this yet successfully, uh, but working together uh, is, uh, is one of the ways that we'll find a, a successful way to make sure our, our democracy is, uh, is safeguarded. Uh, because all of the experts say the, uh, the first Macron election was, was, there was a serious attempt to, to intervene and interfere. Um, uh, he, uh, he managed to prevail in any event, uh, but uh, certainly the attack was on. Uh, in the Brexit um, referendum, the attack was on. Certainly in the Trump election in the United States, the, the attack was on. Uh, so it would be naive to think that our democracy um, is impervious to this sort of stuff. Uh, it's, um, it's potentially the victim of it. Uh, and uh, Canadians need to be alert to it, to learn how to recognize it. Uh, and we all have to have the, the gumption and the courage to call it out when it happens. It's definitely an emerging issue. Um, you know, I mean, it's here today, but uh, it seems to be growing. And I, I, I note, uh, um, I think it was two days ago here in North America, uh, somebody used uh, artificial intelligence to generate a picture showing an explosion at the Pentagon down in the United States. And the um, stock market actually took a dip from that particular picture. Oh, yeah. An hour or so later that they actually declared there had been no attack on the Pentagon and, and the stock market bounced back to where it's going to be. But it just seems a lot of the tools we're bringing, they carry elements of those that may want to use them for uh, disrepute can uh, can you know put them into the system and, and cause problems. So it's going to be something we're going to have to keep a very, uh, very close eye on, I think, going forward. As you Absolutely. And, and there needs to be, I think, a very substantial effort on the part of those outside of government. Uh, who can bring uh, a broader perspective and bring uh, academic expertise and impartiality to the whole discussion. Whenever uh, a politician or even a reform politician comments on, on these sorts of things, it's always a little bit suspect. Uh, so you need the, uh, the independence of academia uh, and the media, uh, the, uh, the professional journalists of the world, uh, to be a part of, uh, of, of this discussion as credible sources of reliable information that can be verified. Let's, let's turn maybe to the, um, uh, the war in Ukraine. There's a, a question here about that, and I think people are obviously very interested in it. We, we share so many of the, uh, of the, uh, the same values, it seems, as Ukraine right now. But uh, the question is from Dave Morgan, and it goes, uh, do you believe that the UK will be financially and strategically able to continue its major armaments, armaments support of President, uh, to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people? I think the UK is the second largest provider at the moment, right after the US. The, the US is 
a long way ahead of everybody in terms of the actual uh, dollar amount involved, but the, the UK would be second. Um, uh, and they show absolutely no sign of weakening in their resolve uh, whatsoever. Uh, ben Wallace, the Secretary of State for Defense in the UK, has been clear on that point. Uh, the uh, the uh, Foreign Minister, uh, James Cleverly, uh, has been very clear. Sunak, Prime Minister Sunak himself, has been very strong and clear. Uh, and the language they use is getting more and more unequivocal, uh, standing with Ukraine with whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Um, the uh, uh, the the UK, uh, I think, has played a uh, a very important role uh, in in being a strong European voice on this topic from the very beginning. Uh, you may recall that Boris Johnson was probably the first Western leader to make a surprise visit to uh, uh, to Ukraine uh, uh, in the uh, in, in the spring of last year, uh, and he, right now. Where is he? He's in Texas talking to the leadership of the Republican Party uh, to try to tell them uh, don't fall off the wagon on this uh, on this issue and 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 succumb to the uh, blandishments that you will hear from uh, from Florida. Uh, the uh, the British have been have been very vocal. Uh, they've been unequivocal in the way they have expressed themselves. Uh, and they have put their money where their mouth is. Uh, and I don't see any sign of that weakening. I, I want to ask you, um, it's a, an adjoining question, I guess I would describe it as, and that is, uh, when you look at what's happening in Europe today, and, and again, the war being at the, the crux of it, there seems to be a bit of a shift in uh, the power dynamics amongst various countries in Europe right now. Uh, it seems to be shifting a little bit from France and Germany uh, over to maybe Poland, okay? And some of the countries, that, if I can call it right on the front lines, I mean, you've seen the three Baltic republics that have really stepped up, and I don't remember which one of it is, but one of them, I think, has shipped almost every uh, every munition and every, um, you know, every uh, uh, item of war they possibly could into uh, into the Ukraine to assist them. But there does seem to be a change in the dynamics right in Europe. Um, can you comment on that a little bit and, and what you think a post-war Europe might look like? Well, it's very interesting. Yeah, you know, Europe developed in a certain way after World War II uh, through the Cold War uh, with, at that time, the division of Germany uh, into, uh, into, into East and West and the, uh, the uh, uh, existence uh, in Europe of uh, very large uh, uh, military installations uh, with the United States and, and, and others. Uh, and the, the creation of the United Nations that identified five certain countries as having the special veto in the UN uh, Security Council. And that kind of solidified, those various things, solidified the, uh, the power equation uh, that had uh, the UK and France and Germany, uh, uh, Italy uh, to, uh, uh, to a certain extent as well. Um, at the uh, at the at the front of the bus, if you will, in terms of, of power and exercising uh, post-war authority, um, uh, but I think uh, that all kind of went quiet in the post-Cold War era. We all thought we had a peace dividend that uh, turned out to be uh, not as lasting as anyone would uh, uh, would hope it would be, and now with war emerging uh, on the continent again for the first time in, in 75 years, uh, the, um, the lines are, are not quite the same as they were. I think, I think you're right. Um, uh, first of all, um, coming out of, uh, of, uh, of, of this horrible conflict, uh, the most heavily armed nation will likely be Ukraine. Um, and uh, Poland has been has been especially vigorous, uh, and I think that's been surprising to a number of people that that Poland has been has been so forthcoming and 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 so uh, uh, 
so authoritative in, uh, in, in exercising its support for Ukraine. You also saw in that period immediately after the invasion, um, in just that first few weeks after February of 2022, uh, there were international and defense and <coughs> excuse me and foreign policy changes uh, in uh, in Finland, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Germany, uh, right across the piece. Uh, the, the the power dynamic was was shifting. Excuse me. Um, I, I'm not sure we know exactly where this is going to end up, uh, but I think you're right to say it'll probably be different from the configuration that we saw uh, at the at the beginning of the war. Obviously, because a lot of things have changed fundamentally, uh, and the assumption on the part of some in Europe <coughs> that you could successfully work with Putin has turned out to be absolutely false. Um, that, that, that is a very dangerous form of behavior. Uh, and and uh, there, are, there are some in, in Europe who may still uh, uh, harbor that, that, that thought or that hope or expectation, but it will be a very long time before most people in Europe, especially the ones on the fringe uh, adjacent to Ukraine, It'll be a very long time before any of them uh, will be uh, trusting again. And look at Finland, um, had the longest border with, uh, uh, with Russia uh, in the north um, uh, and uh, uh, took, a, took a neutral stance in order to maintain that border. And within a matter of days last spring, a year ago now, um, they uh, uh, made the decision that they were joining NATO. And, and started that process and changed the nature of that border in Northern Europe. So uh, yes, a lot of things are changing and I don't think we know where the, where the wheel is gonna stop. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable when you think back, uh, you know, to the Iron Curtain, okay, and it's fallen, okay, and Second World War. I mean, the, uh, the history is of change and I'm, I'm sure that's gonna continue for the next, uh, the next period of time as well. Uh, mm. that's something on the on the economic side, this comes from uh, from Linda uh, on uh, energy security and critical minerals. How do you see Canada, Saskatchewan, and the UK collaborating? Uh, what are some of the challenges you foresee? And, and if you could speak specifically, maybe to nuclear power as well, in answering that question, especially small modular reactors, which you know are becoming uh, more and more of an answer, it seems, in Canada for decarbonization. And I I assume it's going to yeah. be the countries. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're working on those issues uh, through the High Commission almost every day. Uh, we have a, 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 a very dedicated economic unit uh, looking at the potential of these new opportunities. Uh, nuclear is certainly part of that. Canada has a, a Canadian company, has a big investment in uh, uh, the UK nuclear fusion operation. Now, that's, that's long term for the future, but Canadians are major players in that. Uh, the, uh, the whole notion of uh, a small modular reactors uh, is, is one that the UK is looking at just as we are. We may find ourselves in competition on that one because Rolls-Royce uh, sees themselves as a, a major future producer of, of, uh, of SMRs. Uh, so we'll have to make some strategic decisions about whether we'll be, whether we'll be partners or, or competitors on, on that front. Uh, but there, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of scope for some very uh, very vigorous dialogue going forward to sort out our, our respective roles. Um, uh, carbon capture and utilization is, uh, uh, is part of the equation. Uh, Canada's uh, ability to be an important part of the supply chain on critical minerals. Uh, the, uh, the facilities that are being developed uh, in Saskatoon uh, for the processing of, of uh, critical minerals, as well as the operations I believe in British Columbia and Quebec and potentially in Northern Ontario. Uh, all of that is of interest to the UK uh, because obviously they want to develop a, a uh, reliable supply chain uh, that can satisfy their needs. Um, their minister responsible for this, Minister Ghani, has already been to Canada and has signed a framework agreement uh, with the, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson, 
uh, a framework agreement for how we will collaborate with each other on the supply chain for critical minerals. Um, so that work is, uh, is, is going forward. Uh, and, and Canada's seen as a, as a very important player because outside of China and Russia uh, and um, uh, some of the countries in, in Central Asia, uh, Canada is one of the principal uh, uh, suppliers of, uh, of, of critical minerals. Um, again, it's an area where, where the, uh, the, the necessity of dealing with, with the consequences of climate change uh, and the, all, all of the conversions to, uh, uh, to a uh, lower carbon future um, is, is a huge challenge uh, for a country like Canada that has been uh, so dependent for so long on uh, uh, conventional uh, sources of energy. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to, to get your head around uh, uh, an economy that may potentially some years down the road be completely different. Uh, but we need to put the building blocks in place uh, so that uh, we are ready and are not left behind as that conversion takes place. And Saskatchewan, because of uh, our, our huge deposits of high-grade uranium, uh, because of the existence of, a, uh, of an international corporate giant like Cameco, um, because of the, uh, uh, the accumulated uh, scientific expertise at a place like the University of Saskatchewan on, on nuclear issues. Uh, because of all of that, Saskatchewan has some, some built-in advantages that we should be uh, exploiting. We've, we've got some, at least, of the, uh, of the critical uh, minerals. Um, uh, we have uh, the PTRC at the U of R, uh, which pioneered carbon, carbon storage uh, before most people had even heard about it uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So, so Saskatchewan has a leg up in a lot of these areas, and we've got to be vigorous and aggressive, but we can be as successful in this new economy as we have been in the old one. And uh, we just need to make sure that we have all hands on deck working to make sure we wring out every advantage that we have. Um, one, one last question. Um, we, we haven't really talked about politics in, in, uh, in the UK, and I know you have to be very careful about that. You're walking a fine line. But um, the, the, late, the Conservative Party has been in power now for uh, an extended period of time in, in, uh, in Great Britain, and we've seen what they have to offer, and uh, their new Prime Minister seems to be doing a great job at stabilizing the country and stabilizing the political, uh, uh, the political situation. There doesn't appear to be that there'll be a, another replacement uh, immediately. So, uh, But I'm interested a little bit in, in your perspective on the Labour uh, Party in uh, mm. Okay. What uh, what their policy framework looks like, uh, the leader, uh, just a, a little bit of insight on that, okay, and and sort of what we're going to see in terms of the two parties uh, when they go to election, what they're going to be fighting on, and the issues they might be fighting uh, uh, one another about. Uh, when I arrived here in the spring of 2021, uh, Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party were 20 points ahead and winning every election and by-election in sight. Uh, Mr. Johnson was, was thought to be uh, an absolutely uh, uh, overwhelming election winning machine. Uh, and to that point in time, he had been. Um, then uh, the uh, consequences of some of the COVID issues, the cost of living issues, a number of uh, uh, internal scandals and ministers resigning and one thing or another all accumulated so that by the by the spring of 2022 uh, he was in considerable uh, political difficulty uh, and actually had to resign uh, on the, um, the the 7th of July I think it was in in 2022 so a year from 2021 to 2022 made a huge difference in uh, in domestic politics and at one point during uh, the the interregnum there when when uh, Liz Truss was the prime minister labor had moved from 20 points behind to being 40 points ahead uh, they're now about 18 or 19 points ahead which would tend to suggest a, 
uh, a fairly comfortable win. Would it be an absolute majority? Uh, hard to say, but but certainly a, a, a labor win. Um, and you can tell from the demeanor of, of the Labor Party uh, that they have built up a considerable, considerable amount of, of uh, internal self-confidence and, and momentum. Uh, they're, uh, they're sort of feeling it, if you will, that, the, that they've got the, uh, uh, the wind in, in their sails. Um, Mr. Starmer, I think, is, uh, is uh, focusing on being unscary because he's seen previous leaders of the Labour Party, like Jeremy Corbyn and, and others, uh, defeated because the British public were frightened by them. Uh, and so the Starmer strategy is to be reassuring, to be low key, uh, to be a competent, if somewhat boring, but competent uh, prime minister in waiting. And that, that is the image that he's, that he's trying to, uh, uh, to work on. Um, and the polls would say to a certain extent now that is, that is working very much uh, in his favor. Uh, the, the five things that Mr. Knack always mentions, he's going to cut inflation in half. He's going to grow the economy with better jobs. He's going to see the national debt falling. He is going to reduce NHS waiting lists, and he's going to stop the votes of uh, migrants coming across the, the English Channel. For Mr. Starmer, the five things, they each have five. The, the five things, I should have, should have remembered that from a previous, from a previous life. Uh, the five things for Mr. Starmer are having the best growth in the G7, the NHS fit for the future, safe streets, in other words, uh, tough on crime, um, breaking barriers to opportunity for, for uh, middle and lower income people, and uh, transforming Britain into a clean energy superpower. Uh, as, you, as you read those various lists by the various political parties, they sound very familiar. Um, on both sides of, of, of the Atlantic, appealing to the mainstream, they're appealing to, to uh, pocketbook issues. I think the issue is one of timing. For Mr. Starmer, at 18 points ahead, is he peaking too soon? Can he sustain this, this margin of victory over the next 12 to 15 months or more? And from Mr. Sunak's point of view, he's delivering a lot of tough economic medicine right now that is absolutely essential. Uh, the markets and the financial experts and the, and the commercial media and so forth are giving them a lot of credit for delivering the right medicine to fix the ailments in the, in the British economy, but it's not very popular. It, it hurts. And will the benefit of those policies show through fast enough to deliver a re reward to Mr. Sunak by the time he has to actually pull the plug and go to the polls. Um, so it's a, a timing issue on, uh, on both sides. It's going to be a fascinating year and a half as the, uh, as the, the British get ready for this next general election. And uh, it'll be an interesting distraction from whatever's going on in, uh, in the United States at exactly the same time. Well, the world seems to keep changing as fast as it possibly can. So uh, I do want to say uh, thanks very much for uh, uh, you know granting us the privilege of listening to some of your opening comments and for answering our questions. Um, you know, we couldn't ask for uh, sort of a better person to give us an idea of what's going on in the UK and in Europe more broadly. So again, thanks very much on uh, behalf of all the participants. I also want to um, just commend you, okay, for always keeping Saskatchewan in the back of your mind. Uh, I always hear something about what uh, Saskatchewan might be able to take from some of what you're involved in, what you can do. And, and again, a small province in a big country in a big world. And it's uh, nice to have individuals such as yourself that are out there thinking of our province. So again, thank you very much on that as well. And if maybe I can ask uh, people to uh, extend their congratulations, maybe through clapped hands or some other uh, some other mechanism, okay, that would be your <laughs> Again, thanks very much, Ralph. I, I appreciate it. And for giving us the time. I know it's late evening right now in, uh, in London. So again, thank you very much. My pleasure, uh, Ron. And it's one of the first days where it's been bright and sunny for 24 hours. And that is rare in London when you get 24 hours of sunshine. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.